Um, wet bulb temperature in, in 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 meteorology is the is the is the minimum temperature that the air can fall through evaporative cooling, and so and so this becomes important for for animals that that cool through through evaporative cooling through sweating, um, because if you're unable to cool your body sufficiently then the heat build, the heat balance is off and it builds up in your body and can c cause um, organ damage you know mm -hmm. basically i mean that's what that's what heat stroke is it's damage to your organs from getting too hot mm -hmm. and so it's been theorized that the 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 maximum um, wet bulb temperature for for human survival um, for you know any anything more than a few hours is is around 35 Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit. So that's the mm. so you could get that you know from obviously 95 Fahrenheit, 100 percent humidity, or you could get it through a, a temperature that's higher and humidity that's lower. But mm -hmm. um, the the getting that hot is uh, is ex is extremely dangerous for human human's ability to survive and mm -hmm. and I, I actually earlier today i i went on went on my um uh, weather page on facebook and looked at an old post that i did last year after the heat wave was over where i had actually calculated the wet bulb temperatures for a bunch of locations in the pacific northwest after the event and most of them fell in the range of the 20 uh, maxed out around 25 to 28 celsius mm -hmm. um uh, so that's the mid 70s to the low 80s in terms of wet bulb temperature and i mean people that were there <laughs> it was unbearable yeah, yeah. <laughs> people were, were suffering and then some people obviously died in, in, in some cases maybe in their homes because it, it got even hotter in their homes sure. than it was outside um so you don't need the 35 C. I mean, I mean, if the planet were to warm really extreme to like, I've seen a, I see, I saw one study some years ago. It was like a, more than a decade ago. Someone did a, um, a modeling of what the world would look like at 10 C because I mean, some of the most extreme climate models at the time were like projecting like nine, 10 degrees mm -hmm. C, uh, C of global warming. Um, and in much of the tropics would just be just be roasted i mean there would just be no right. ability for anyone in the tropics and much of the subtropics to be able to survive because it would be widespread mm -hmm. temperatures at or exceeding um or, or what bulb temperatures at or exceeding 35 celsius but right. you you don't need to to, you don't need to get to 10 c to start having some of those like really extreme heat in, um uh, wet bulb temperatures hit individual parts of the planet and you don't need to get to even get to 35 C wet bulb to uh, to see people dying because I mean that's just like the most healthy of people mm -hmm. um, but people that aren't healthy or older or younger or um, have other issues even medications that make them more heat sensitive they take mm -hmm. them and make them more heat sensitive they can they can drop um, in that kind of heat, um, yeah. where the, maybe the wet bulb temperature is twenty eight Celsius or twenty nine or thirty Celsius. Um, I've seen values of thirty, thirty one Celsius occur before in like um, um, the United Arab Emirates or Qatar, these places that are near the Persian Gulf, where the Persian Gulf gets extremely hot, and yeah. um, you can get hot during the day. <clears throat> it's dry heat, but then you get an onshore flow where you get this moisture that comes off the Persian Gulf and suddenly the humidity spikes mm -hmm. and your heat index and the wet bulb temperature spike and it gets extremely hot for a short period of time. And I'm sure people in those mm -hmm. countries retreat to their homes and try to turn out whatever air conditioning mm -hmm. they have and try to survive. But I, I mean, you're, you're talking about how you don't have, didn't have air conditioning. I didn't have air conditioning growing up in Seattle either. And I mean, um, I remember the first time Seattle ever recorded a temperature of 100 degrees, a triple digit temperature was in 1994. I think it was July, 1994. And 
we didn't have air conditioning and i mean it was a it was it was hot in the apartment yeah. like my dad um had to like put up put up car pieces of cardboard to block the heat the sun mm -hmm. uh, from the windows and we turned on fans had all the windows open it was crazy and then i yeah. was actually in seattle during the summer of 09 so i was going to the university of nebraska but i didn't uh, i came back home for the summer and they had the heat wave that was the um, preceded in terms of records preceded the heat wave last year in terms of record setting was the summer of 09 where we had um, a, a record all time record high of 103 and that was unbearable. Yeah. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. I, yeah. So, I mean, yeah, yeah. It, Seattle keeps getting hit with more um, in the whole Pacific Northwest is really starting to ramp up seeing more heat events more uh, drought um i remember um going to seattle in february of i think 2015 just to visit my family and getting off the plane and, and getting on the bus to leave SeaTac airport and i looked at the mountains and there was just barren land because it was drought so there was no snow over the entire winter and it was just like the glaciers that were there in barren land on the on the olympics it was just like mm. snow, so snow so i i've had those kind of periods where it's just where you're just kind of looking at things and you're like wow this is like this is really happening yeah. <laughs> things are really changing you know and yep. you know it, it's one of those things where you know you have a season or two where the snow comes back where the rains come back where yeah. the um, the heat doesn't come Mm -hmm. um, where maybe you have a season, maybe you go a year without any real incredible extremes of any kind, but then they always come back again, and they come, and it seems like they come back with a greater um, ferocity than they did yeah. previously. And that's kind of that's kind of the way I almost describe climate change to people. It's like um, gaming the system to more extremes compared to what we experienced in the past. You know, mm -hmm. growing up in Seattle or growing up where you grew up, you know, you see the, you, you know what the weather is expected to do. You know, occasionally there's these extremes, there's flooding, there's heat, there's, you know, you know blizzards, there's this and that. But yeah. then you, you notice over time, okay, it seems like things are really ramping up. And so I would, you know, that's why I described earlier that it does seem like throughout the world that there's a, a ramping up of these extreme events. Um, where yeah. the records, the records of the past aren't safe anymore, and even the records that are set now, you you wonder how long are they going to remain on the books? How long is right. the new record high, all time record high in Seattle going to last? Will it will it be broken by twenty thirty? You know, will it be sure. will it be twenty thirty five? You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, how long can it last? Um, you just it, it, yeah. it it's really a ramp up. Yeah, and I think part of the the concern part of it is is how it's not just that temperatures are, are that we're breaking temp uh, temperature records around the world but it's also how s much like like some of these temperatures we're talking about in Europe or wherever i mean this is happening in june this is happening you know earlier and earlier in the year we're seeing you know heat that is just yeah breaking temperature records it's happening earlier and earlier in the year so that seems to be part of it as well as is how much earlier these things are happening you know, seasonally. And I think that that is obviously affecting, because, I mean, it's really important for agriculture to have certain things happening at certain times of the year, certain, you know, rains come in at a certain point, uh, or, uh, you know, the the, the more, um, the hotter parts of the, the season or the summer come in at a certain point. So you can kind of plant things and prepare things at certain times and it seems that it's really difficult for for farmers and people who are producing all the food that we rely on uh, to be able to plan and and uh, you know actually adapt to these changes because they're th everything feels so unstable and so seemingly random. So you don't know when it's going to happen, and and you know there's like massive crop failures one year, and maybe another year it's actually not that you know it's hard to plan ahead. It seems, and I think that that is one of the yeah really important uh, parts of climate disruption is it's just it's difficult to adapt because it's seemingly so like chaotic and random right 
Yeah, yeah, there's a lot, definitely a lot of chaos. <laughs> and I mean, it, it's, yeah, I mean, for agriculture, they need a, a they need consistency and they need balance, balance between the heat and the cold, the balance between um, too, you know, too much moisture and too little moisture. And obviously for whatever you plant, it, it's different. Um, but you need whatever it is you're, that you're, that you're planting um, for crops. You need to know that on average you can expect in any given year, okay, it's going to be like this. It's going to be mm-hmm. like that. And I, obviously if I take a big hit, that's going to stink, but you know, yeah. You know, there's, I mean, and, and, and built into a lot of a lot of countries, they have insurance and stuff like that to help people with loss if there's loss. Um, uh, but that, de- but even insurance depends on the, afford- the affordability of insurance and the profitability of being an insurance company depends on mm-hmm. the level of consistency as sure. well. Right. That you expect, okay, you're going to pay out, but on the hour, on the whole, you're going to be you're going to be making a profit and you won't be failing as a company because the climate changes are so bad or so the climate is so chaotic that you can't even uh, do business, do the business you want to do. And that which you would then affect the ability of farmers to, to have any sort of fallback financially mm-hmm. if, if their crops were to, were to fail in a particular year. Um, so there's a, there's a lot of interconnections that go on between climate, you know, and the economy and, you know, yeah. and, and, and the ability for people to depend on things to be going a certain way, you know, on average right. in any given year. And obviously, if things are great, that's great. If things aren't so great, that's bad. But you even then you can depend, okay, well, next year will probably be better. In a couple of years, it'll get better. Um, mm-hmm. You know, but with climate, with, with a chaotic climate that's warming, and warming at a faster rate, you know, how can you possibly depend on, on, on consistency because you're getting all of these inconsistent impacts that you can't, that are difficult to predict, you know, you you really can't do that. And so, um, that's why humanity should probably be doing better (laughs) to stop climate change (laughs) to the best of their, or slow it down to the best of their ability. But mm-hmm. that does not, you know, that does not seem to be. Uh, 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 I mean, it's talked about a lot that we should be doing that as a, as a global civilization. We should be doing more, but what we're actually doing doesn't really seem to be having much um, uh, effect. Everything's getting worse. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's uh, there's a lot of intersecting things happening because it just seems like at a time when we need incredible will to make enormous changes and sort of radically reimagine how we engage with our planet, how we have relationship with the earth, uh, how we conceive of economics and, and, uh, you know, politics. It's just like the very, the very systems that brought us to this point are not being thoroughly, they're not going to change. They're actually getting worse. Um, and it seems like we're we're moving even further in buckle. Well, I say we, but the political systems, the economic system itself, is 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 holding on even tighter to the paradigms that got us into this crisis to begin with. So, instead of drawing down carbon emission, we're going to increase carbon emissions because we need more oil. Because the oil prices are so high right now, we need more oil yeah. production. You have the you know the war in Ukraine is causing all of these agricultural issue to, uh, issues in um, you know the the food supply the the uh, the 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 you know distribution of, of various agricultural products across Europe and the you know the rest of the world and also of course it's affecting oil you know inflation is extremely high right now so what seems to be happening as things get more difficult for the average person right? It's, you know, things are really expensive right now. <laughs> like trying to yeah. go and buy like basic food items has just skyrocketed yeah. over the past several months. Um, gas again is extremely high. Most of us need a, to drive to work because we live in a country built around that. Uh, mm-hmm. So my point is, is like, it's, it's really hard for us to imagine anything changing politically uh, in addressing obviously this existential crisis, when 
we feel like our, you know, have to tighten our belts and we have to really think about like immediate concerns of survival. And so it's, it's this really tough bind that we're in. And I don't know if there's a question here for you. I just want to comment on the situation that we're all in where we're trying to survive and pay rent and pay the bills and just survive in an economy like this while the planet is on fire. And we obviously should be doing things to mitigate that to the best of our ability. Um, yeah. But it, it's it's a it's a hell of a time to be alive, right? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's interesting. Um, we see this um, uh, be this this issue in uh, emergency management. Um, for those that don't know, I'm a PhD student in EM. Um, yeah, uh, but uh, you know, the thing with 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 emergency management is that there's these disasters and these catastrophes, but they're not, they're not, they're not caused by nature. They're caused by the vulnerabilities that society had in place prior to nature mm -hmm. coming in and, and sort of removing the, the blanket or removing the clothes and revealing the problems that existed before mm -hmm. the, before it, the hazard agent entered the environment the human environment. And so, you know, you know, because of that, um, all of these, a lot of the issues that revolve around trying to improve the, you know, improve the disaster experience for people and really reduce the risk of disasters even happening involves a lot of social and societal issues that are largely left unaddressed, you know, mm -hmm. you know, issues, you know, regarding um, the rights and, and access to uh, access for, for to resources for people who happen to be um, poorer, you know, right. um, that's a big one. Um, a lot of racial and ethnic strife in a lot of countries. I mean, we talk about the issue of race in America, but there's a lot of countries where a lot of people that are in minority religions or minority ethnic groups suffer all the time, you know, mm -hmm. struggle all the time. What do you think, what do you think people think happens in a disaster when you get a hurricane or you get an earthquake or a volcanic eruption or some other uh, event that disrupts society, causes societal disruption, damages the environment, damages the built environment, mm -hmm. you know, what, ha what happens? Well, maybe in the immediate wake of the disaster, you get a lot of altruism. You get people helping people. That's very normal. That's very well documented for you know past 60, 70 years of disaster research. Right. But then the struggles come after the disaster, right. the, the immediate effects of it, and recovery. And people um, will many times struggle to get the help that they need uh, because of uh, these pre-existing issues in society that were never addressed before and either in terms of recovering from what happened or being able to uh, be, have a state of readiness for the next event, which is, mm -hmm. you know, or reduce the risk of, of having something happen in the next event. And so, uh, you know, a lot of these social justice issues, a lot of, a lot of societal issues that you were just talking about at the beginning of the program that you, they, that you say you've been having a lot of shows about mm -hmm. those things spill over into the, into the issue of disasters. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I yep. mean, you know, reproductive rights, for example, you know, the right to, to decide whether you want to bear, you know, children or not, you know, control your reproduction. Um, you know, that's an economic, that's a social issue, economic issue. And that only affects what you would do and how you'd respond and how your ability to recover in, in, in say, disaster events. I mean, all yeah. these things have interconnections. All these societal problems have connections. And, and so, you know, those that are in, 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 in political power or in power or these power structures that um, re really refuse to address these long-term um, either social issues or the science that's telling them that the more carbon you dump into the atmosphere, the hotter the planet's going to get, and the more um, uh, 
impacts you're going to have, the, the physical more, you know, impacts you're going to have from these physical agents, this heat, the, this heavy rainfall, these things that are going to, you know, cause effects, the more harm you're going to cause people, particularly people that were already being harmed, all, harmed or disadvantaged all the time in day-to-day -day social life. And yeah. so, you know, what are you going to do about that? And so far, I mean, we have, you know, we have all, you know, we have, you know, the Paris Agreement, we have the Sendai Framework, we have all of these things that talk about, you know, trying to, trying to deal with um, climate change and deal with disaster risk reduction. Um, but at the end of the day, you're not really seeing enough movement that really, really gets at the, tr the transformative changes that are necessary to really do the things that are required to reduce risk to people into ecosystems and to in 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 what it, in what we in in protect what it, we need in order to survive on this planet you know mm. so i mean it, it's 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 kind of a thing where you know i know you know a lot of people go after or attack people who are kind of doomish and stuff and yeah, you know you know mm. i know Mike, Michael Mann has had a big thing over the years with his, you know, anti-doom um, uh, talk, you know, and, yeah. and not wanting to go and go down that, that route. And I kind of, I mean, I understand his perspective on yeah. that, but mm -hmm. at, the, at the same time, I can't blame people for going down that route when you yeah. see these, these political and social structures that seem unmoved. You know, they seem unmoved by what we're seeing is like, like they don't like those that run the world, I guess, you know, the wealthiest among us, they don't realize that even they are at risk, you know, yeah. even if their risk like right now is much lower than say, you know, th say the poorest person in the poorest country in the world, they are still, they are still at risk. Everyone on the planet is at risk. So at least care about yourself enough to care about everybody else. But, yeah. Um, so far, the movement has been uh, very uh, weak relative to to what is needed.